Amen. How's everybody doing? Hey, I want to tell you, uh, it's an honor for us to be here as always. I want to thank, and, and they, they hate when I do this, but I can't help it. I'm so thankful to Pastor Eric and Jen and uh, everybody that does this for Pastor Hutchinson and Pastor Treister and all of all the efforts. I know I'm giving uh, accolades to these guys, but I know everything that goes into this. And I just want to say thank you from King's Harvest and on behalf of everybody. Can we give these guys a hand for all their work? It's a lot of work to do this, and it's but it's so worth it. I mean, it's so worth it to be sharpened the way that we're being sharpened. All of us in this room, me right now, the messages that have already come forth, they've already sharpened me in a new and greater way. How many of you have been sharpened already? Hey, I, I promise you, you're going to get sharpened even more. And look, when we get sharpened, sparks are going to fly, right? As that all that stuff that was not sharp gets taken off of your blade. And the exchange, though, is a razor-sharp blade that chops the heads off of giants. Amen. All right? And, and we got to realize that. I, if I'm going into battle, I don't want a dull blade, man. I want a sharp blade. We sharpen one another in this place when we do this. So let's just drop any distraction right now in the name of Jesus. Let's drop every little yeah, yeah thing in our mind and our what's going on in our life. Nothing is going on in our lives except what Jesus is doing right now in this place. Come on, that's got to be your mindset because it's not, you're going to walk through those doors and you're going to stay dull and you're going to find yourself in a knife fight with a big old giant and you're going to have a butter knife and you're going to be like, man, I wish I would have allowed some sparks to fly in my life at that conference. I wish I would have allowed God to move in me. But look, it's going to be too late at that point. I, I've, I've been in that spot. I've been in knife fights with giants and realized, oh, I'm lacking. I had to go run to my brothers and say, I need sharpening. I need encouragement. How many of you know that's what we're doing in this place? Amen. Amen. And look, there are giants right now in each of our church's way, in each of our church members' way, in marriage's way, that their heads need to be removed from their bodies. Amen. Come on. Is that, is that too graphic? No. Did, uh, okay. All right. I, I didn't think so. Yeah. I mean, I want to see spiritual blood flying and everything. Come on. David was a young boy when he did that, by the way. Don't, don't forget, he chopped that dude's head off with his own sword, right? I mean, and he was a kid. So certainly all of us can handle spiritually chopping some heads off the enemy. Amen? Well, listen, I have three things that I want to encourage you with this morning. And the message... And the passage and the theme is in 2 Kings. If you turn there, please, 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, I know you know the story. Pastor Eric prefaced it, and he briefed us, and it was wonderful. Uh, I just want to bring out a couple of points that I know the Lord's put on my heart. The Lord actually put this message on my heart specifically for this moment, probably three months ago, four months ago, when Pastor Eric and I talked somewhere around there. I'm getting old. Time, time, I don't know what time is anymore. It's just, it's just leaving me. Um, and the Lord doesn't ever do that. Usually my messages come as I'm getting on the stage, as I'm the morning of. I'm like, Lord, what do I speak? What do I share? And the Lord is radio silence. He's like, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. I'm working some things out. And for me, someone who's terrified of speaking in crowds and getting up in front of people and doing anything, terrified, literally terrified, that's a real terrifying place to be when you don't know what you're going to speak, when you're not good at speaking. But you know the Lord loves when I'm in that place because my flesh just goes, ah, and it squeals because it doesn't like being in that place. And the Lord's like, yeah, keep putting that to death because I have something that I want to do in you and it's not going to be on your strength, it's going to be on my strength. Well, the Lord does that to me quite often. But I was very fortunate that he spoke to me about this message. So I was so encouraged. I was like, thank you, Jesus. Give me a break here. But it was, it was I know it was specifically for this, for us this morning. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these three points. And I got a little poem. No, I'm kidding. I don't have it. Uh, I got these three points. And then we're going to have a little bit of an altar time. I'm not going to belabor the point. We're going to get out of here on time.
We are going to get out of here on time in the name of Jesus. And at the end, I'm going to invite, and I'm saying this preemptively just so the elders in the room uh, know this. At the end, uh, Will and Tanya and Heather and Jeremy and Lynn are going to get up here, and Eli, and they're going to do a little bit of worship, just a little bit. And we're going to have the elders just pray for anybody that wants to pray specifically about the message that the Lord's going to share with us right now. Amen? So that's our idea. Look in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, verse 1. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram, Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. Verse 3 says, She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. I want you all to understand that this story starts with this slave girl's faith. And we have some awesome men of God in here. We have some not so awesome men of God. We've got this real bad boy commander in Naaman, uh, who is a, a, an awesome guy in, in his military might. I mean, he's a, he's a you know, four-star general. Those guys are not pushovers. Those guys are warriors. They are conquerors. They're bad to the bone. Naaman was that dude. There are stories, written songs written about Naaman. He was revered. Israel actually kind of feared him as a general because they knew they had this presence in the northeast corner of their, of their province where this King Aram had this, this general Naaman. He was a bad dude. And Pastor Eric talked about confronting bad dudes in our life, confronting bad scenarios, confronting danger is how Pastor Eric said it, right? And it's a challenging word. And I want you to look how easily this young Israeli slave girl confronted this danger in her life. She was put in the most vulnerable position. She would, if any man in this room, I don't care how tough you are, how macho your beard is. <laughs> By the way, I'm jealous, just so you know. I'm very transparent. I don't care how, how good you look in those tank tops. <laughs> Some of you look better than others. <laughs> look, I'm not wearing one. I mean, I mean, look, I'm not. For reasons, for a good reason. But the point is, I don't care how tough you are, men. If you were in that slave position, nobody wants to be in that position. What would be going on in your heart? If you've been kidnapped, taken from your people, you're in the enemy's camp by this big bad dude, no telling what's going on. She's a slave girl that they have kidnapped from Israel. Do you know the bitterness and animosity? You would want to be confronting and, and pro proclaiming truth. You'd probably be har harboring, I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think about this often. What would I do in that place of where I'm in a bad, bad spot, in a prison somewhere, or in a place where uh, I'm powerless. Men, you know what I'm talking about? Think prison. Think prison. Think being a prisoner. That's a terrifying thought. And if you've ever been in a fist fight, or if you've ever been in wrestling someone, or whatever, or, or done anything like that, and realized you're inferior, that's a terrible place to be. I'm telling you, when you confront that danger, that's what presenting the gospel feels like. It feels terrifying. It, it feels like uh, something that is greater than you, greater than your inabilities, and it's much greater than your strengths. And I'm telling you that this faith that this slave girl speaks, this truth that she speaks, it's the most powerful part of this story for me. It gets me every single time I read it. This slave girl, instead of harboring bitterness, I mean, the guy was dying of this skin disease. She could have been like, yeah, I hope you die. God of Israel, please kill him. I take this as your will. Go ahead and smite him. I hope he dies a really brutal death. No telling what's going on. And it's seemingly she'd be justified. I know in our flesh, 
We feel like we'd be justified to pray that. But the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> is that she honored that authority even though it was wicked. Even though it was, she was enslaved, she was stolen away from her people. You talk about confronting danger. Now the challenge is for us, we can't even, we can't even confront danger when we have a negative Facebook post uh, against us or when we encounter someone doesn't thumbs up something. We're so finicky in our presentation of the truth of God's word that we're not, th this should challenge all of us to our core. This person was in the most vulnerable position ever as a slave. And she said, hey, my God can heal. She spoke this truth in the most adverse situation we could possibly be in. And look at the story that develops after this. Look how God begins to move. And she has compassion on this man, Naaman. She has the same compassion that we should be showing everybody that we come in contact with. The whole reason why this exists is so that we can start revival in the hearts of Naaman's. That's, that's the whole reason why this exists. This isn't, you're not, we're not here for your, for your benefit. We're here for his benefit. It's not the one association's kingdom that we're advancing. It's the king of kings kingdom that we're advancing. Right? I mean, that, that's the idea. So I want us to all put ourselves in this position of this slave. Now, I'm not saying be effeminate. Or I'm not saying we need to be docile and see the world, the, the Christian, worldly Christian, contemporary, whatever, this facade of Christianity, that they've gotten it wrong. They think that they need to be timid and childlike in their demeanor and they've got to be, that's, that's not what this is. You know how much guts it took for this young girl to speak up? Because if she's wrong, that, that, what, did, what do you think? She's already a slave. No telling what's going on. But if she's wrong... And she's sending this general into the enemy's camp to seek healing. What do you think they're going to do to her? She didn't care. Talk about DCD. <laughs> I mean, she gave zero Ds. I uh, no, didn't care. Right? Zero. She didn't care. She spoke up. She spoke truth into utter despair. I want to ask you, are you speaking truth into whatever you're calling your utter despair? I guarantee you, you're not a slave girl in an enemy camp. And none of us are in that place. I know some places might feel that way, but they're not. And regardless, in those situations, you need to speak the truth of God and watch what God does. That's the bottom line, man. You need to confront danger and... and it's not about being effeminate. It's about being courageous. I mean, you talk about taking some guts to do what she's doing. I want you to understand that God has called you to be that exact same slave girl and to speak truth in the exact same manner. And if you don't, this story never happens. Look real quick, if you would. I had a scripture. Look in Romans chapter 1. Keep your finger in 2 Kings. Look in Romans chapter 1. Like Pastor said, we, we like to just read these stories and think of them as good fables and good bedtime stories or whatever. We, we, we separate ourselves from the fact that these stories are about us. You and I are still writing this story right now. The Bible hasn't ended. Jesus has not returned on the second coming, has he? No. Your lives are still writing the power of God out in humanity right now. This is ongoing. We can't just read this story about this slave girl and be like, oh, that a girl. That, you are supposed to be doing the same thing that this girl is doing. It's still being written. Paul talks about it too. Look at Romans 1. Paul, verse 1, a servant of Christ. That word servant, by the way, how many of you have a Bible that says slave? Anybody? Yeah. If you look at the word, the word is doulos. I'm sorry for any... Greek people, that might have just butchered that word. Doulos, that's right. Thank you. That word is doulos. It literally means slave. It means that your life belongs to someone else. See, Paul understood this concept of this young Jewish slave girl. And Paul knew what it cost him. Pastor Eric talked about this morning, so did Brother Pastor Brent. It costs you everything like your life belongs to someone else. 
And it doesn't make you not speak truth. It makes you speak truth more boldly. It makes you speak truth. And when you speak that truth, see the powers and principalities, they understand who you're representing. The problem isn't that the powers don't know. The problem is, is that the powers don't know that you represent God because you don't speak truth in every situation. We don't confront danger. We don't do it. We, we, unfortunately, we cower. We go with the status quo. Look around you. I mean, we've been talking about it. And I don't want to belabor the point. I just want to encourage you, in every scenario, have the audacity to be that slave girl. Have the audacity to have the mindset that I'm a slave for you, Jesus, and whatever. I'm, I'm down with it. I'm game. If it means being in the enemy's camp, if it means being in prison, if it means that I have to go to church and I, somebody might have COVID next to me, if that's what it means, so be it. Whatever it is. I mean, look at what, we're, what God's asking of us. It's nothing. It's nothing. I mean, listen, if we don't have this mindset, the church is going to crumble. We see it crumbling all around us. The church needs some CDC people right now to confront danger in this manner and have the mindset of Paul like, hey, I am a slave for the King of Kings. And I love it. I rejoice in it. Look what he says. Paul, a servant or a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the Spirit of holiness, somebody say holiness. holiness, was declared with power to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 5, through Him and for His name's sake, we, look at your neighbor and say we, we, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Look at verse 6. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So Paul just sums it up right there for all of us. This didn't stop with that letter. This continues to go on to this very moment, this meeting right here in your churches, wherever you're located at in the churches of the One Association, you are called to the same slave-like Christian walk. This exact same thing. But there's nothing more powerful than this idea of confronting danger with your tenacity of, for obedience for what God's called you to. And it's something that we're just getting separated from. We're getting diluted. We're getting encouraged to compromise. Oh, no, we, can, we can't meet. You might, you might kill your grandmother. You might kill... An, all, it, think of your children. I am thinking of my children. I am thinking of my grandmother. That's why I have to meet. That's why I have to, because I don't belong to myself. I belong to Him. And if He says don't forsake the assembly, guess who's not forsaken the assembly? This homeboy right here. I'm not doing it, right? This slave girl right here. This slave of the King of Kings. I'm not forsaking the assembly. I'm going to be with my brother. I am going to be my brother's keeper. Y'all remember our one association meeting? at hot sweaty denim springs in a tent I need I need my brother and my brother needs me I mean it continues to ring true to this day I'm gonna encourage you tonight or today this whatever time it is to continue to confront danger with reckless obedience to the King of Kings and it means that you put every desire in the slave ship in the ownership of the Almighty and watch what God does Let's look real quick. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Let me remind you of something. I know y'all know this. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Let me remind you what a biblical snapshot of speaking truth looks like. Oh, that's better. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 32. You know, Pastor Eric challenged us, we, we need to confront danger to save the whole world. We need to confront danger in our own lives. And how about we save 
and, and, and turn our coworkers and our workplace upside down for Jesus? How about we, how about we focus on our families and, and, and where God's called us to right at this moment? Some of us can't even confront danger in our own marriages. Well, my wife will get mad if I tell her that. Well, my husband, he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, well. Look at Hebrews 11. I'll let y'all's pastors address that. <laughs> Look at Hebrews 11. I'm going to get myself in trouble. We're gonna, we have a clock around here? I'm not going to worry about it. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. <laughs> and what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to, what does your Bible say? Strength. And who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Verse 35 says, Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. They confronted danger and then said, hey, no, there's some more danger that I'm going to confront still. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sodded too. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts, mountains, and in caves, and in holes in the ground. These, verse 39 says, were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Look at this type of faith. The world was not worthy of them, but yet to this they were called. I mean, you want, to, you want the definition of what it means to be a slave to this word that we're reading? To be a slave to what the word of God is doing? This is it in a nutshell. The world isn't worth. Naaman's not worthy. It's not... She didn't speak truth because Naaman was worthy of the truth. She spoke it because God was worthy of his word, of this truth. Right? This, this thing where we think like, yeah, well, I will serve as long as I'm built up. I will be a slave as long as there's, you know, I get my name on the back of my jersey or whatever. The real thing is, is that there is a great cloud of witnesses that has gone before us that are that is still going on today, and the world doesn't deserve our obedience, yet that's what the world has to have so that they would have revival in their hearts, so that they could be healed of this disease of sin that they have. And it is a thankless, it is a, the world's not worthy of it, but the Lord commands you to live that type of CD, DC, DCD life. The CDC messed that up, by the way. Stupid CDC. I don't like them on a lot of levels, but that's another level I don't like them on because they messed that up. But this is what God asks of you. And it is something that in the calling itself, you have to die to your flesh. At every turn, it never stops. It, see, that's why we have to be sharpened because it's so easy to become complacent. And it's so easy to have this group and all of this... Uh, all of our amenities that we have, it's dangerous because these amenities can cause you to feel comfortable and think like, well, I don't have to give that up. Well, surely the Lord wouldn't. The Lord is asking you to give up your life and also not get any credit for it. I mean, He wants all the credit. That's what it means that He gets all the glory. He's jealous. You think, well, no, He's jealous for me. He's jealous for you to display truth in every scenario. If you don't do it, I guarantee you the world won't do it. I guarantee you the, the contemporary Christian American church, they won't do it. Haven't they proven that? We have to be those that confront this dangerous message. 
We have to be those that confront this dangerous lifestyle. And look, it, it costs you everything, literally. It's being a slave. There's nothing greater, there's no greater calling than this. That you would be able to demonstrate the will of God and His kingdom being developed and being demonstrated on earth through your entire life. There's nothing greater. Don't take it for granted. Don't treat it with contempt. Don't allow your life to become complacent. I know the world around us is encouraging that. But God demands that you give your life up and then give Him all the glory. And that's the bottom line. I'm encouraged whenever I see men and women like you in this room. I know what God is doing. He's building up something special with people, with warriors that have this mindset. There's some really big giants out there that their name is on our sword. I, I don't, I, I, there's some dangers out there, and, and, and I know Pastor Eric, all the pastors here know it. There are some things that God is working and doing through the obedience of this room, and it's going to save Naamans everywhere. We have to continue to do what God's called us to do. The enemy is trying to get in there. He's trying to get a foothold in our lives. You've got to stand strong and say, Lord, not only am I going to give you my life, but I'm going to give you all the glory for my life as well. Come on, saints. It's everything. Look at 2 Kings. Go back to there real quick. Second Kings chapter 5. I'm going to briefly look at Elisha. Again, I'm not going to belabor any points because I know the other pastors are going to share some things about this. Pastor Eric, honestly, what time am I supposed to be out of here? Brother, you have all the time you want because I promise you we'll get here at 1 o'clock. Got it. Amen. I'm going to use, I'm going to use every, 50, every 55 of them. 2 Kings chapter 5. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, Elisha sent a messenger to him, Naaman. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh shall be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. <laughs> I told you, he's a bad dude. Look, he's like, I, tell your God to come heal me, right? I mean, he's, he gets what he wants. Verse 12, are not Abana and Par, uh, Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. So you want to talk about confronting danger again. Elisha knows who he is in the Lord. And he knows what the Lord has spoken to him. He didn't even allow Naaman to come into his courtyard because there was no need. He had the word of God. He had the truth. And he has one of the most powerful generals in the region coming to him saying, Hey, call out to your God and heal me. I got a bunch of gifts for you. I have lots of door prizes. And I'm going to give them to you. I need your God to come heal me. I don't like this skin condition that I have, and I want your God to heal me. And Elisha says, hey, player, stop right there at the gate. I've already got the word of truth, and I'm not going to play around with you. I'm going to tell you, go do this and, and, and go wash in the Jordan seven times. And it, the Jordan, how many of you have been to the Jordan? How many of you know it looks like, yeah, it looks like the Amy River for my Louisiana brothers and sisters out there. Yeah, not much to it. Naaman was, was from the Damascus area, mountain water, where there was mountainous, clear, uh, uh, beautiful. It was, it, it was detestable to him to have to go and obey truth. And look what Elisha's doing. He's literally speaking truth to one of the baddest generals in the area. Do you know what Naaman could go back and do if he wanted to, if he was offended at Elisha's truth? He could start a war. I, I want to encourage you. When you confront danger in, in what God's called you to, you, you're going to expose your family, your marriage. Everything is exposed. L look what, 
this is what I mean. Look what Elisha was, was in, the, in the balance here. It was the entire nation of Israel. Their, all of their lives were in the balance. For, Na, for Elisha speaking this truth. You, 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 we want to talk about confronting danger. He literally put every life in Israel in harm's way, including his own, for the sake of the truth of the Word of God. Amen. I hope we're understanding the real gravity of this. Like, we're worried about elderly people in nursing homes, which I love elderly people. I have elderly grandparents. I love them to death. Uh, my, my, my children, I love them. I love them completely. But compared my life, my wife's life, I don't love anybody in this room more than I love my wife, all right? And her life, compared to the truth of God, is secondary. I, I know this makes us all uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable saying it. I don't like saying it. We all say, like, well, I'll give my life for the king of kings, but not my kids. Or not my... Listen, Elisha's saying, look, Naaman, I know you're a bad dude. I know that you're a warring general. I know your guys are more powerful than us. But the truth of my God is more powerful than anything on this earth. And I'm going to speak truth to you. And I know you're not going to like it. And Naaman was in a rage. Did Elisha run after him? Ah, wait, let me change it just a little bit and make it more palatable for you, general. No, no, he didn't at all. He's like, tough. That's why God says, go do it if you want the healing. Now listen, when you present what God's called you to, do it without apology. Do it in love. Speak truth in love, of course. But speak truth regardless of the circumstance. Regardless of the, the virus or the plague or the government or the situation. Well, Justin, that could mean I might be persecuted. Jesus promised it. He promised it would happen. Yeah. Did, did Pastor Brent say if they don't call you a cult, you're not doing it right? Is that what, was that Pastor Brent? Yeah. Truth, brother. I'm honored. I got my cult status. <laughs> we need to make a t-shirt. I think we do. We do have a t-shirt. <laughs> we do. It's true. Look, it, it's true. And... You, t the second you worry, if Elisha worried about, like, if I tick this dude off, it could be war. If he, if he compromised that for a second, he, he's out of the profit game. He's no longer qualified. It's not up to him to determine what is palatable and not palatable. It's only up to him to speak what God says to speak. You're in the same boat. You're in the same scenario. Your life is no longer... If you're a slave, then you don't have any options other than to do what the Master says for you to do. Amen. And look, well, you'll find that when you live that way, there's nothing beneficial about it. There's not riches. There's not glory. Your name doesn't get put on the back of your jersey. There's no big contracts. It's not... You don't get your name in lights. You don't get to do what you want to do. You get to do what He's called you to do. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing better on the planet Earth because what he does, when you're a slave to him, he frees you of all this stuff that you have. Some of you are struggling with whatever you're struggling with. It's because you're not fully a slave to the King of Kings. And I'm talking, we got to get down deep. And that brings us to our next point. And I'm going to end here very soon. Look in Psalm 15. Tell me when you're there. Psalm 15, verse 1. Listen to David. I love David. I can't wait to hug that dude. Verse 1 says, Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? He whose walk is, what does your Bible say? Blameless. And who does what is righteous 
Who speaks what? Saints, I can't hear you. Who speaks what? Who speaks truth. Not your truth. His truth. In every circumstance. Look what David says. He who speaks truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man, who despises a vile man but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps his oath even when it feels good. Now what does your Bible say? Even when it what? Even when it hurts. Who lends his money without usury and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Look in Proverbs chapter 12 very quickly. Proverbs 12 verse 15 says, The way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. A fool shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. A truthful witness, verse 17 says, gives honest testimony, but a false witness tells what? Tells lies. Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise bring what? Healing. Healing. Truthful lips endure how long? Forever, but a lying tongue lasts only a moment. There is deceit in the hearts of those who plot evil, but there's what? Joy for those who promote what? Peace. Listen, I'm telling you that the King of Kings has called you to this place where you're at right now to confront every danger that's anything that goes against God's will. Anything. Anything that goes against the will of God. That's you confronting it. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not necessarily this big uh, uh, battle that uh, Islam's coming and invading or communism's coming or Antifa. The, 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 that's not the battle. The battle is in your heart. The battle is in your obedience. See, the battle is that Naaman that's inside each one of you. Does everybody here have a Naaman in them? A big, bad, sinful nature that's a tough guy that's at war with the things of God? Every single one of us. And what it's at war at, really, is you being obedient like that slave girl. It's at war with you being obedient like Elisha. It's at war with you compromising the truth of God for your own benefit, making it palatable for your neighbors, your mama, your daddy, your family members, your, your church group, or whatever it is, your workers, whatever your, 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 your personal conviction is. That Naaman is at war with God's truth. And I'm telling you, you want peace. You want God's love. You want God's endurance. You want God's joy. You want all these things. It will not happen unless you speak His truth in every situation. But I know, look, I know we like to say, and my King's Harvest people are tired of this message. I would bet money that your pastors have said this over and over as well. But this is why that Uber Grace message that's going throughout the Christian church in America is so sick. Because what it does is it separates you from the conviction that you should have to continue to put that Naaman down in your heart. Because it, 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 it literally tells you, I, we all got a little Naaman in us, but God's grace, thank, thank God, blood of Christ, right? I just got to go down to the altar and I'll just confess my sins before I go to bed tonight and everything will be fine. God's grace, we're in Dallas, I can do that. Wave after wave after wave after wave after wave of grace. What's that, what that is really saying is wave after wave of complacency after complacency of compromise and compromise and compromise. That's what that's saying. That's wave after wave of allowing me to allow that Naaman part of me that God is trying to wash and cleanse away to stick around and interfere with the Word of God in my life. That's what that's saying. I, I want to tell you, when we continue to do this, we trample underfoot, like Paul said, what Jesus did for us on the cross. And there's no longer room at the cross for us. There's no longer room for us to be obedient. We've worn that out. We've compromised it to the point where we're naming in the story. We think we're somebody. I'm telling you, 
We're nobody unless Jesus is completely in our lives, unless we're a slave to him in every single scenario, at every single turn. And let me tell you, that's a constant battle. That's something that you have to tell God, I want you to purify me. There's something specific that you need to do. And this is the word. All of us in this room are clean. I'm not talking physically. Some of you might be dirty. I don't know. I hope you're clean. If not, go get cleaned up. But I'm saying spiritually, we've all, I've seen you at the altars. I prayed with some of you. I know, I know, I look around this room, we're all clean. But to be used by God and to confront this danger, you've got to do some cleansing that is like Naaman. God's got to do a revival in some areas in your heart that he's asking you not to, not to get clean for clean sake. We all know Jesus. We understand this. But God wants you to specifically, and this is the challenge, he wants to expose those areas in your life that you're not a slave to God in. And we, there's areas in this room right now, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to drum up an altar call. Or you can stay in your seats and just raise your hands and, and the elders will come pray for whatever. I mean, I think you should come forward when we're praying or whatever. But I want to tell you that you need to wash yourself with the truth of God, what He's speaking to you this morning. And, and don't run from it. I got a quick story, and it's, it's, it's very quick. I, I, uh, and when I tell this story, put you in this story, all right? Put yourself in the story. My wife and I went to a hotel recently. E easy. Uh, we went to, it was a vacation. That we, we went with our family to a hotel. I don't know why I worded it that way. <laughs> My family and I were at a hotel. <laughs> uh, and at this hotel, uh, I went into the bathroom, and um, I don't know who designed this bathroom, but they were some sort of sadist of some kind, but in the bathroom, there's a point to this, just hear me out. Uh, when I turned the lights on, it was uh, a full mirror, like from here all the way to the ceiling, from to the bathtub or to the shower, all the way to the tub. It's a big, big mirror. And the, and the lights, when I turned it on, they were like uh, surgery lights, what they have in the surgery room, like the, the sun lights that are bright white. It was white light, bright. And it startled me to see myself that brightly. And, I mean, because this is the thing. In my house, in the way my wife has our bathroom, the lighting is, is comfortable, it's warm, it's flattering, actually. Uh, it is. It's a flattering light that we have. The mirror is not a full exposure mirror. It's a mirror that gets... This part that I like to, that, you know, I don't have to work on. Doesn't show love handles. Doesn't show, you know, it just shows this part. I'm like, all right, everything's good. All right, lights are right. This is that's all I got to look at. So when you go from that, the way you like it, to a place that is real exposure, not like you like it, it, it can be startling. And if that wasn't bad enough, over to the wall to my left, as I'm looking into this mirror that's too big and the lights that are too bright. By the way, one light switch turns every light on the whole place. Can't, like, change them. It's one light, surgery, lights, big mirror. If that wasn't bad enough, when I look over to the left, this weirdo that made this bathroom put a mirror for the entire wall from floor to ceiling, wall to wall, toilets right there, right there, and right here is a glass wall shower. So no matter what you do in that bathroom, you are seeing yourself literally from head to toe. And you have to do things in there that you can't hide, right? 
<clears throat> and, and I felt so vulnerable in that place. I'm just being honest. You ever go try clothes on in the dressing room and they have those little oct half octagon mirrors? And you're like, wow, I'm seeing way too much of myself. <laughs> and then you're like, is that what I look like from that side angle from behind? That's what it was like in this bathroom times a thousand. I literally was like, babe, thank you for loving me. Thank, thank you for being, just showing some attraction towards me. I don't blame you if you never kiss me ever again. I didn't know what you were having to deal with. <clears throat> it's true, I felt exposed. I was, I was super vulnerable. It hurt me. But this is the point. God genuinely spoke to me in this, that stupid bathroom. <laughs> and he said, look, I need to expose you spiritually. You've taken some areas of my word and you've made them your bathroom mirror. You've dimmed some of my lights. My light's bright. You don't dim it. You don't control the truth. You don't speak your truth. You don't speak the word the way you think it should be. You speak my truth. You speak it how I say. You speak it when I say. You speak it how I say to say it. And you speak it in every circumstance, every situation, and to heck with everything else. And I'm going to keep exposing you until you get this right. And you can hide, put on baggy clothes, you know. You can get the lights how you like them. But the Lord will not use you for His purpose until you expose yourself and allow yourself to be exposed in the full majesty and truth of God's Word. And there's a, there's a template that God set up for us. Look in Exodus. And I, I'm done with this. Look in Exodus chapter 30. Tell me when you're there. <clears throat> This is the last danger that we have to confront. It's the danger of our own nakedness. It's the danger of our own embarrassment. It's the danger of our own cowardice. It's the danger of our own truth. It's the danger of our own naming. Look at Exodus chapter 30, verse 17. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing, place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and their feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not, what does your Bible say? So they won't die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting an offering made to the Lord by fire, they shall wash their hands and feet so they will what? What, what does it say? So they'll what? So they won't die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. This is the deal. This washing is not you bathing. It's not you coming to the altar. It's not you, uh, you're, you're quiet. We're all saved. I get it. We all know Jesus. We all have a relationship with him. This washing for the priesthood was to be used specifically for a purpose that God had in store for them. The priests, when they came, they'd bathe. They were clean. They'd, they would do their inspection for the offerings they were brought. They would do their chores. They would do the things that they had to do in the priesthood. We're all doing the things that we're supposed to do. You're reading your Bible. You're coming to church. You're doing all these things. But in some areas of our life, the Lord is asking you to do more, and He wants you to do more. And you've got to confront those areas where you're saying, well, I'm clean. I'm doing the Lord's work. The Lord asks more of you every single day. And some of us need to not stay in that place where we're clean. We need to get cleaner, if you will. We need to clean some specific places in our life, our hands and feet that will be used by God. So that we can not just walk clean in His presence, but so that we can walk clean in what He's called us to do. Because let me tell you, not only is there Naamans in the Naaman in your own heart, but there are Naamans all around you that are looking for someone to show them what the truth of God really looks like. 
And the challenging part of this is, to me, is that if we don't go to that bronze laver and look at ourselves and see who we are and see what we need to clean and we don't take the ladle and wash our hands and wash our feet, then God says, if you don't do this, you'll what? You'll die. You will literally, spiritually die. I'm telling you, saints, God's called us to be used. His Kodesh, set apart for His purpose, sanctified, cleansed for a greater purpose than just you being saved. You didn't come to know Jesus just for you to get to heaven. If that's why you came to the King of Kings, you're not confronting danger. You're, you're, you're coasting. God called you to confront Naaman at every turn. God called you to come and wash at his altar. To, to let yourself be fully exposed by the image of God's perfection in his word. He's called you to that. Don't divorce yourself from who God's called you to be. God's called you to be cleaner. God's called you to be used, to be set apart. He'll have it no other way. How many of you know that to be true? I encourage you right now. We're going to end. Y'all please stand up if you would. I'm going to read this last part. <clears throat> this is... 2 Kings 5.15 says, Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him. This is after he's been cleansed. You'll all know the story. Yeah, praise the worship team. Come on up, please. He was healed. His skin was made new. Naaman comes back to Elijah. He says, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I'll not accept a thing. Even though Naaman urged him, he refused. He still wouldn't compromise. God, I love that. Verse 17 says, If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. Naaman literally wanted that foundation. He literally wanted the ground where God was to bring it to back to his land that he knew wasn't holy. Just so he could have the earth, so he could have a foundation. Do you know that there are Naamans out there that need to see you living this type of life that we're preaching about this morning and today and through this conference? Because they don't have a foundation. Their foundation is at the temple of Ramon. Literally the temple of the air. The power of the air is what it was. That's what Naaman said, look, and also, would you please tell your God that when I go back and I have to bend the knee to Ramon in the temple, please ask him to forgive me. And you know what Elisha does? He grants it to him. He says, yeah, you'll be forgiven. Do you remember in John chapter 20 what Jesus said? Does anybody remember? It's, a, it's an interesting passage. Jesus rose from the grave. Everybody's been spirit-filled. He breathes on the apostles and he says, be filled with the spirit. And he says, go, anybody who sins, you forgive, they're forgiven. Another passage? John 20? It's a, it's a weird passage. To me, the, the correlation here is that God's power, this cleansing, this responsibility that he's given you, it, it costs you everything. But to be able to walk in the anointing and the power of God through every circumstance, Jesus, it's worth everything. And that's what God's called you to do. To literally walk around this earth in this fallen state with the power of the prince of the air and all of the worries and fears and for you to walk around declaring truth and it costing you everything. And it's something that Christians, even Christians in this room, we're not... We're not allowing ourselves to be fully exposed. How many of you know that God is exposing some things in your heart right now? Right? I mean, look, don't run from it. I told you sparks fly when you're getting sharpened. Sparks are flying in my own heart. I'm preaching at myself. I'm in, I'm in that mirror right now myself. Don't run from it. Run to it. 
Say, God, I want you to use these hands. I want you to use these feet. I want you to use these hearts. I want you to use these children. I want you to use my parents, my co-workers, every naming that's in my path, every naming uh, thing that's inside of me. I want you to use it, and I give it all to you, and I do it gladly, and I don't want a reward. I just want you to have the glory. I just want you to use me. That's got to be your heart's cry. How many of you want that right now? Amen. Let's pray. And y'all pray with me. And I'm going to ask all the elders of all the churches, if you'd come down. As these guys just worship, there's no, if you, if you got to go, if you got whatever, it's fine. But as we pray and as these guys worship, I just want to, I want to invite you to come down and just ask the Lord, Lord, I want you to wash those areas of my heart, of my mind that have compromised I want you to cleanse me of this Naaman-like mindset. I don't want, I want to do away with it right now in the name of Jesus. And I just want to ask all the elders and their, and, and their wives to come down. And let's just ask the Lord to expose us. Lord God, we tell you right now in the name of Jesus, we don't want that lighting to be our own lighting. We don't want that, that little mirror in our bathroom to be our mirror. We want the full mirror of the Word of God. We want the bronze labor, Lord God, to expose every bit of us, Lord God. We want to take your word, your truth right now in the name of Jesus. And we want you to wash us clean in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we put aside everything, Lord God, that would stand between us and you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we want to run to you. We want to run to you in every area of our lives, Lord God. I, I pray against the lies of the enemy, the lies of compromise the lies of hidden sin, the, Lord, the lies of hidden uh, 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 compromise and, and comforts, Lord God, amenities. Lord God, we just, we rebuke that right now in the name of Jesus. And we say, Lord God, we want to confront danger in our own hearts first. And then we want to confront danger in every turn, anything that would go against your word and your will for our lives. Lord God, do a work in these people's lives in the name of Jesus. Do a work, Lord God, in marriages right now. There are spouses that are not here that are supposed to be here. Stand in the gap for them right now. Don't let bitterness, don't, don't let bitterness come in. There are children that should be here right now. Pray for them. Don't worry. Don't fear. Expose all that right now in the name of Jesus. There's obvious financial concerns. That fear, that worry. Expose it. Expose it. Say, God, I give that to you. Cleanse that part of my heart that is stubborn, that is worrisome. Let all that stuff fall away in the name of Jesus. Lord God, thank you for your grace that you've given us. Grace that allows us to change. Not stay the same in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace, your peace, your comfort. But Lord God, I pray that it propels us forward to do works of service for your kingdom. It doesn't allow us to stay status quo. Cleanse us, wash us in those places.